We all know that one eerie tale that has kept us up at night. What if there was a library full of them? Welcome to the Library of Shadows. Narrated by Tatiana of Please Live by Night. The Wolf Girl by Alvin Schwartz. Travel northwest into the desert of Del Rio, Texas, and eventually you'll come to Devil's River. In the 1830s, a trapper named John Dent and his wife, Molly, settled where Dry Creek runs into Devil's River. Dent was after beaver, which were plentiful here. He and Molly built a cabin from brush, and near it they put up an arbor to give them shade. Molly Dent became pregnant. When she was ready to have their child, John Dent raced on horseback to their nearest neighbors several miles away. My wife is having a baby, he said to the man and his wife. Can you help us? They agreed and came at once. As they got ready to leave, a violent storm came up and a bolt of lightning struck and killed John Dent. The man and his wife managed to find the cabin, but did not arrive until the next day. By then, Molly Dent was dead too. It looked as if she had given birth before she died, but the neighbors could not find the baby. Since there were wolf tracks all around, they decided the wolves had eaten it. Then they buried Molly and left. A number of years after she died, people began to tell a strange tale. Some swore it was a true story. Others said it could never have happened. The story begins in a small settlement a dozen miles from Molly Dent's grave. Early one morning, a pack of wolves raced in from the desert and killed some goats. Such attacks were not unusual in those days, but a boy thought he saw a naked young girl with long blonde hair running with the wolves. A year or two later, a woman came upon some wolves eating a goat they had just killed. Eating the goat with them, she claimed, was a naked young girl with long blonde hair. When the wolves and the girl saw her, they fled. The woman said that at first the girl ran on all fours. Then she stood and ran like a human, swiftly as the wolves. People started wondering if this wolf girl was Molly Dent's daughter. Had a mother wolf carried her off the day she was born and raised her with her pups? If so, by now she would be 10 or 11 years old. As the story is told, some men began to look for the girl. They searched along the riverbanks and in the desert and in the canyons. And one day, it is said, they found her, walking in the canyon with a wolf at her side. When the wolf ran off, the girl hid in an opening in one of the canyon walls. When the men tried to capture her, she fought back, biting and scratching like an enraged animal. When they finally subdued her, she began screaming like a frightened young girl and howling like a frightened young wolf. Her captors bound her with rope, put her across a horse, and took her to a small ranch house in the desert. They would turn her over to the sheriff the next day, they had decided. They placed her in an empty room and untied her. Terror-stricken, she hid in the shadows. They left her there and locked the door. Soon, she was screaming and howling again. The men thought they would go mad listening to her, but at last, she stopped. When night fell, wolves began howling in the distance. People say that each time they stopped, the girl howled in reply. As the story goes, the cries of wolves came from every direction and got closer and closer. Suddenly, as if a signal had been given, wolves attacked the horses and the livestock. The men rushed into the darkness, firing their guns. High up in the wall, in a room where they had left the girl, was a small window. A plank was nailed across it. She pulled the plank off, crawled through the window, and disappeared. Years have passed with no word of the girl. Then one day, some men on horseback came around a bend in the Rio Grande not far from Devil's River. They claim they saw a young woman with long blonde hair feeding two wolf pups. When she saw the men, she snatched up the pups and ran into the brush. They rode after her, but she quickly left them behind. They searched and they searched, but found no trace of her. That is the last we know of the wolf girl, and it is there, in the desert, near the Rio Grande, that the story ends. Sam's New Pet Sam stayed with his grandmother when his parents went to Mexico for their vacation. We are going to bring you back something really nice, his mother told him. It'll be a surprise. Before they came home, Sam's parents looked for something Sam would like. All they could find was a beautiful sombrero. It cost too much. 
But that afternoon, while they were eating their lunch in the park, they decided to buy the sombrero after all. Sam's father threw what was left of their sandwiches to some stray dogs, and then they walked back to the marketplace. One of the animals followed them. It was a small gray creature with short hair, short legs, and a long tail. Wherever they went, it went. Isn't he cute, Sam's mother said. He must be one of those Mexican hairless dogs. Sam would love him. He's probably somebody's pet, Sam's father said. They asked several people if they knew who its owners were, but no one did. They just smiled and shrugged their shoulders. Finally, Sam's mother said, maybe he's just a stray. Let's take him home with us. We can give him a good home and Sam will love him. It is against the law to take pets across the border, but Sam's parents hid the animal in a box and no one saw it. When they got home, they showed it to Sam. He's a pretty small dog, said Sam. He's a Mexican dog, his father said. I'm not sure what kind. I think it's called a Mexican hairless. We'll find out. But he's nice, isn't he? They gave the new pet some dog food. Then they washed it and brushed it and combed its fur. That night, it slept on Sam's bed. When Sam awakened the next morning, his pet was still there. Mother, he called. The dog has a cold. The animal's eyes were running, and there was something white around its mouth. Later that morning, Sam's mother took it to the veterinarian. Where did you get him? The vet asked. In Mexico, she said. We think he's a Mexican hairless. I was going to ask you about that. He's not a hairless, the vet said. He's not even a dog. He's a sewer rat. And he has rabies. A weird blue light. Late one night in October 1864, a Confederate blockade runner slipped by some Union gunboats at the entrance of Galveston Bay in Texas and made it safely to port with its cargo of food and other necessities. Lewis Billings, the master of the small vessel, was getting ready to weigh anchor when he was startled by a shriek from one of his crew. A strange, old-fashioned schooner with big black flag was running down at us, Billings said later. She was afire with a sort of weird, pale blue light that lighted up every nook and cranny of her. The crew was pulling out the ropes, doing other work, and they paid us no attention. Didn't even glance our way. They all had ghastly, bleeding wounds, but their faces and eyes were those of dead men. The man who had shrieked had fallen to his knees, teeth chattering. All he gasped out was a prayer. Overcoming my own terror that was chilling the very marrow of my bones, I rushed forward, shouting to the others as I ran. Suddenly, the schooner had vanished before my eyes. Some say that it was the ghost of Jean Lafitte's pirate ship, Pride, that sank off Galveston Island in 1821 or 1822. She was seen again in 1892 in the same waters with the same crew. The Trouble The events in this story took place in 1958 in a small white house in a suburb of New York City. The names of the people involved have been changed. Monday, February 3rd, Tom Lombardo and his sister Nancy had just come home from school. Tom was going on 13. Nancy was 14. They were talking to their mother in the living room when they heard a loud pop in the kitchen. It sounded like a cork had been pulled off a bottle of champagne. But it was nothing like that. The cap on the bottle of starch had somehow come unscrewed, and the bottle had tipped over and spilled. Then bottles all over the house began popping. Bottles of nail polish remover, shampoo, bleach, rubbing alcohol, even a bottle of holy water. Each had a screw cap that took two or three full turns to open, but each had opened by itself, without any human help, then had fallen over and spilled. What is going on here? Mrs. Lombardo asked. Nobody knew. But the popping soon stopped and everything went back to normal. It was just one of those crazy things, they decided, and put it out of their minds. Thursday, February 6th. Just after Tom and Nancy got home from school, six more bottles popped their caps. The next day, at the same time, another six did. Sunday, February 9th. At 11 o'clock that morning, Tom was in the bathroom brushing his teeth. His father was standing in the doorway talking to him. All of a sudden, a bottle of medicine began moving across the vanity by itself and fell into the sink. At the same time, a bottle of shampoo moved to the edge of the vanity and crashed into the floor. They watched, spellbound. 
I better call the police, Mr. Lombardo said. That afternoon, a patrolman interviewed the family as bottles popped in the bathroom. The police assigned a detective named Joseph Briggs to the case. Detective Briggs was a practical man. When something moved, he believed that a human or an animal had moved it, or it moved because of a vibration or the wind or some other natural cause. He did not believe in ghosts. When the Lombardo said they had nothing to do with what was going on, he thought that at least one of them was lying. He wanted to examine the house. Then he wanted to talk to some experts to find out what they thought. Tuesday, February 11th. The bottle of holy water that had opened a week before opened a second time and spilled. Two days later, it spilled again. Saturday, February 15th. Tom, Nancy, and a relative were watching TV in the living room when a small porcelain statue rose up from the table. It flew three feet through the air and fell into the rug. Monday, February 17th. A priest blessed the Lombardo's house to protect it against whatever was causing the trouble. Thursday, February 20th. While Tom was doing his homework at the end of the dining room table, a sugar bowl at the end flew into the hall and crashed. Detective Briggs saw it happen. Later, a bottle of ink on the table flew into a wall and broke, splattering in all directions. Then another porcelain statue took off. It traveled 12 feet and smashed into a desk. Friday, February 21st. To get some peace, the Lombardos went to a relative's house for the weekend. While they were gone, everything at home was normal. Sunday, February 23rd. When the Lombardos returned, another sugar bowl took off. It flew into the wall and smashed to smithereens. Later, a heavy bureau in Tom's room toppled over, but no one was in the room when it happened. Monday, February 24th. By now, Detective Briggs had talked to an engineer, a chemist, a physicist, and others. Some thought the vibrations in the house were causing the trouble. They could come from some underground water, they said, or from high-frequency radio waves, or from sonic booms caused by airplanes. Others said that the electrical system was the cause, or downdrafts coming through the chimney. The popping of bottles was blamed on chemicals the bottles contained. Test shows that there were no vibrations in the house, there was nothing wrong with the electrical system, and there were no chemicals in the bottles that would make them pop. Then what was the causing all the trouble? None of the experts knew, but every day the Lombardos received dozens of letters and telephone calls from people who thought they did know. Many believed that the house was haunted. They thought a poltergeist was on the loose, the noisy ghost that is blamed when things move around on their own. No one has proved that poltergeists exist, but people everywhere have told stories about them for hundreds of years, and what they have told was not too different from what was happening to the Lombardos. Detective Briggs did not, of course, believe in poltergeists. He had begun to believe that Tom Lombardo might be to blame. Whenever something happened, Tom was usually in the room or nearby. When he accused Tom of causing the trouble, the boy denied it. I don't know what's going on, he said. All I know is that it scares me. People said that Detective Briggs was a tough cop who would turn in his own mother if she did something wrong. But he believed Tom. Only now he didn't know what to think. Tuesday, February 25th. A newspaper reporter came to the house to interview the family. Afterward, he sat in the living room by himself, hoping that something would happen and he could describe it in his story. Tom's room was just across the hall from where the reporter sat. The boy had gone to bed, but he had left his door open. Suddenly, a globe of the world flew out of the darkened room and smashed into a wall. The reporter dashed into the bedroom and turned on the light. Tom was sitting in bed, blinking, as if he had just been awakened from a sound sleep. What was that? he asked. Wednesday, February 26th. In the morning, a small plastic statue of the Virgin Mary rose up from the dresser in Mr. and Mrs. Lombardo's bedroom and flew into a mirror. That night, while Tom was doing his homework, a 10-pound record player took off from the table, flew 15 feet, then crashed into the floor. Friday, February 28th. Two scientists arrived from Duke University in North Carolina. They were parapsychologists who studied experiences like those the Lombardos were having. They spent several days talking to the family and examining the house, trying to understand what was going on and what was causing it. One night, a bottle of bleach popped its top, but that was all that happened during their visit. 
They did not tell the Lombardos about a theory they had that a poltergeist actually might be involved in such cases. According to this idea, poltergeists were not ghosts. They were normal teenagers. They had become so troubled by a problem that their emotions built up into a kind of vibration. Since it was taking place in their unconscious minds, they didn't even know it was happening. But the vibration somehow left their bodies and moved whatever it struck. It happened again and again until the problem had been solved. Scientists have given the strange power a name. They call it psychokinesis, the ability to move objects with mental power or mind over matter. No one knew if this could really happen or how to prove it. Yet, most reports of poltergeists did involve families with teenage children, and there were two teenagers in the Lombardo family. Monday, March 3rd, the parapsychologist said that they would prepare a report on what they had learned. The day after they left, the trouble returned with a vengeance. Tuesday, March 4th, in the afternoon, a bowl of flowers flew off the dining room table and smashed into a cupboard. Then, a bottle of bleach jumped out of a cardboard box and popped its top. Then a bookcase filled with encyclopedias fell over and wedged itself between a radiator and a wall. Then a flashlight bulb on the table rose up and hit a wall 12 feet away. Finally, four knocks were heard coming from the kitchen when nobody was in the room. Wednesday, March 5th. While Mrs. Lombardo was making breakfast, she heard a loud crash in the living room. The coffee table had turned over by itself, but that was the end of it. After a month of chaos, everything returned back to normal. In August, the two parapsychologists gave their report. They decided that the Lombardos had not made up the story, nor had they imagined it. Their trouble had been real, but what had caused it? They said that no pranks or tricks were involved, nor any magic. As the police had done, they also ruled out vibrations from underground water and other physical causes. The only explanation they could not rule out was the possibility that a teenage poltergeist had been at work, moving objects with mental power. They did not have enough evidence to prove it, but it was the only answer they had. If it was a poltergeist, they said it would probably be Tom. If they were right, if a normal boy like Tom had become a poltergeist, this also might happen to other teenagers. It might even happen to you. The Little Black Dog Billy Mansfield said that a little black dog followed him wherever he went. But he was the only one who saw it, so people thought he was kind of crazy. To drive the dog away, Billy was always hollering at it, throwing rocks at it, but the dog always came back. The first time Billy saw the dog was the day he fought Silas Burton. Billy was just a young man then, but the Burtons and Billy's family had been feuding for years. When Billy saw Silas riding towards him, he went for his gun and Burton went for his. But Billy fired first. He hit Burton in the back, knocking him from his horse. Burton's horse ran off and his gun fell where he couldn't reach it. He lay there on the ground pleading with Billy not to kill him, but Billy killed him anyway. Burton's little black dog was there with him when he was shot. The dog kept licking Burton's face and barking and snarling at Billy. In his anger, Billy killed the dog too. There was nothing much of law enforcement in those days, so Billy wasn't arrested. But all that night he heard Burton's dog outside his cabin, scratching on his door, barking to be let in. Am I imagining this? Billy said to himself. I shot that dog. It's dead. But the next morning Billy saw the dog, who was waiting for him outside. From then on, there was not a day when he didn't see it, and there wasn't a night when he didn't hear it scratching on his door, barking to be let in. From then on, Billy was always finding black dog hairs on the sofa, on the floor, in his bed, even in his food. And the house and the yard stank of dog. That's what Billy would say. Whatever somebody told him, there's no dog, he'd say, maybe you don't see it, but I do and I'm not crazier than you are. Things went on like that for many years. Then one morning in the middle of the winter, the neighbors didn't see any smoke coming out of Billy's chimney. When they went over to check, Billy wasn't there. A day or so later, they found his body lying in the snow in a field back of the cabin. Billy had plenty of enemies, and at first it seemed like somebody might have killed him, but there wasn't a mark on his body, and there wasn't any footprints there except for Billy's. 
The doctor said Billy probably died of old age, but there was something odd about his death. When the neighbors found Billy, there were black dog hairs on his clothes. There were even a few on his face. It smelt like a dog had been out there, yet no one had seen a dog anywhere. The bed by the window. The three old men shared a room at the nursing home. The room had only one window, but for them, it was the only link to the real world. Ted Conklin, who had been there the longest, had the bed next to the window. When Ted died, the man in the next bed, George Best, took his place, and the third man, Richard Green, took George's bed. Despite his illness, George was a cheerful man who spent his days describing the sights he could see from his bed. Pretty girls, a policeman on horseback, a traffic jam, a pizza parlor, a fire station, and other scenes of life outside. Richard loved to listen to George, but the more George talked about life outside, the more Richard wanted to see for himself. Yet he knew that only when George died would he have a chance. He wanted to look out that window so badly that one day he decided to kill George. He's going to die soon anyway, he told himself. What difference would it make? George had a bad heart. If he had a heart attack during the night and a nurse could not get to him right away, he had pills he could take. He kept them in a bottle on the top of the cabinet between his bed and Richard's. All Richard had to do was knock the bottle to the floor where George couldn't reach it. A few nights later, George died just as Richard had planned he would. And the next morning, Richard was moved to the bed by the window. Now he would see for himself all the things outside that George had described. After the nurses had left, Richard turned to the window and looked out, but all he could see was a blank brick wall. The Window Margaret and her brothers, Paul and David, shared a small house on the top of a hill just outside the village. It was so warm one summer's night that Margaret could not sleep. She sat up in bed in the darkness of her room, watching the moon move across the sky. Suddenly, something caught her eye. She saw two small yellow-green lights moving through the woods near the graveyard at the bottom of the hill. They looked like the eyes of some animal, but she could not make out what kind of creature it was. Soon the creature left the woods and moved up the hill towards the house. For a few minutes, Margaret lost sight of it. Then she saw it coming across the lawn toward her window. It looked something like a man, and yet it didn't. Margaret was terrified. She wanted to run from her room, but the door was next to her window. She was afraid the creature would see her and break in before she could escape. When the creature turned and moved in another direction, Margaret rushed to the door, but before she could open it, it was back. Margaret found herself staring through the window at a shrunken face, like that of a mummy's. Its yellow-green eyes gleamed like a cat's eyes. She wanted to scream, but she was so frightened that she could not make a sound. The creature broke the window glass, unlocked the window, and crawled inside. Margaret tried to flee, but the creature caught her. It twisted its long, bony fingers into her hair, pulled back her head, and sank its teeth into her throat. Margaret screamed and fainted. When her brothers heard the piercing scream, they rushed to her room. But by the time they got the door unlocked, the creature had fled. Margaret lay on the floor, bleeding and unconscious. While Paul tried to stop the bleeding, David chased the creature down the hill towards the graveyard, but soon he lost sight of it. The police thought it was the work of an escaped lunatic who believed he was a vampire. When Margaret recovered, her brothers wanted to move to a safer place, where it would be harder to break in, but Margaret refused. The creature would never come back, she was sure of it. But just in case, Paul and David began to keep loaded pistols in their room. One night, months later, Margaret was awakened by a scratching sound at the window. When she opened her eyes, there was the same shrunken face staring at her. That night, her brother heard her cries in time. They traced the creature down the hill, and David shot it in the leg. But the creature managed to scramble over the graveyard wall and disappeared near the old burial vault. The next day, Margaret and her brothers watched as the sexton of the church opened the burial vault. Inside was a horrifying scene. Broken coffins, bones, and rotting flesh were scattered all over the floor. Only one coffin had not been disturbed. When the sexton opened it, there lay the creature with the shrunken face that had attacked Margaret. The telltale bullet was in its leg. 
They did the only thing they knew of to rid themselves of a vampire. The sexton built a roaring blaze outside the vault and fed the shrunken body to the flames. They watched the body burn until nothing remained but ashes. A new horse. Two farmhands shared a room. One slept at the back of the room, the other slept near the door. After a while, the one who slept near the door began to feel very tired early in the day. His friend asked him what was wrong. An awful thing happens every night, he said. A witch turns me into a horse and rides me all over the countryside. I'll sleep in your bed tonight, his friend said. We'll see what happens to me. About midnight, an old woman who lived nearby came into the room. She mumbled some strange words over the farmhand, and he found he couldn't move. Then she slipped a bridle on him and turned him into a horse. The next thing he knew, she was riding him across the fields at breakneck speed, beating him to make him go faster. Soon they came to the house where a party was going on. There was a lot of music and dancing. They were having a big time inside. She hitched him to the fence and went in. While she was gone, the farmhand rubbed against the fence until the bridle came off, and he turned back into a human being. Then he went into the house and found the witch. He spoke those strange words over her, and with the bridle he turned her into a horse. Then he rode her to the blacksmith and had her fitted with horseshoes. After that, he rode her to the farm where she lived. I have a pretty good filly here, he told her husband, but I need a stronger horse. Would you like to trade? The old man looked her over and said he would do it. So they picked out another horse and the farmhand rode away. Her husband led his horse to the barn. He took off the bridle and went to hang it up. But when he came back, the new horse was gone. Instead, there stood his wife with horseshoes nailed to her hands and feet. Room for one more. A man named Joseph Blackwell came to Philadelphia on a business trip. He stayed with friends in a big house they owned outside the city. That night, he had a good time visiting, but when Blackwell went to bed, he tossed and turned and couldn't sleep. Sometime during the night, he heard a car turn into his driveway. He went to the window to see who it was arriving at such a late hour. In the moonlight, he saw a long black hearse filled with people. The driver of the hearse looked up at him. When Blackwell saw his queer, hideous face, he shuddered. The driver called to him, There's room for one more. Then he waited for a minute or two, and then he drove off. In the morning, Blackwell told his friends what had happened. You were dreaming, they said. I must have been, he said, but it didn't seem like a dream. After breakfast, he went into Philadelphia. He spent the day high above the city in one of those new office buildings there. Late in the afternoon, he was waiting for an elevator to take him back down to the street. But when it arrived, it looked very crowded. One of the passengers looked out and called to him. There is room for one more, he said. It was the driver of the black hearse. No thanks, said Blackwell. I'll take the next one. The doors closed and the elevators started. There was shrieking and screaming. Then the sound of a crash. The elevator had fallen to the bottom of the shaft. Everyone on board was killed. Cold as clay. A farmer had a daughter for whom he cared more than anything on earth. She fell in love with a farmhand named Jim, but the farmer did not think Jim was good enough for his daughter. To keep them apart, he sent her to live with her uncle on the other side of the country. Soon after she left, Jim got sick and he wasted away and died. Everyone said he died of a broken heart. The farmer felt so guilty about Jim's death, he could not tell his daughter what had happened. She continued to think about Jim and the life they might have together. One night, many weeks later, there was a knock on her uncle's door. When the girl opened the door, Jim was standing there. Your father asked me to come get you, he said. I came on his best horse. Is there anything wrong, she asked. I don't know, he said. She packed a few things and they left. She rode behind him, clinging to his waist. Soon he complained of a headache. It aches something terrible, he told her. She put her hand on his forehead. Why, you're as cold as clay, she said. I hope you're not ill. And she wrapped her handkerchief around his head. They traveled so swiftly that in a few hours they reached the farm. The girl quickly dismounted and knocked on the door. Her father was startled to see her. Didn't you send for me, she asked. 
No, I didn't, he said. She turned to Jim, but he was gone, and so was the horse. They went to the stable to look for them. The horse was there. It was covered with sweat and trembling with fear, but there was no sign of Jim. Terrified, her father told her the truth about Jim's death. Then quickly, they went to see Jim's parents. They decided to open his grave. The corpse was in the coffin, but around its head, they found the girl's handkerchief. A Gaviota Media House production. <laughs>